Welcome to this episode of Disease Du Jour on the topic of hoof wall and coronary band injuries with Dr. Craig Lesser of Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital in Kentucky. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Dr. Lesser is an AFA certified farrier. He graduated from Colorado State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2015. Following the completion of an internship at Anokia Equine, he moved to Lexington to complete a podiatry fellowship at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital and joined the practice as an associate. Thank you, Dr. Lesser, for joining us today on Disease Du Jour to talk about hoof wall and coronary band injuries. Thanks for having me. Well, you're kind of in a unique position being a veterinarian and a certified farrier, so we're really looking forward to picking your brain today on this from both sides of the issue. So let's start with some of the most common hoof wall issues that veterinarians see and maybe some of the solutions you have. And let's start with that bad common one, abscesses. Yeah, so, you know, abscesses are, are what we're told in school are going to be why we have non-weight bearing horses and being in Kentucky we see tons of abscesses um, you know and they can be just the simple pop it open and pack up for a few days and never look back abscesses to much more severe abscesses leading towards surgery and for the most part they are the drain and not have any issues um, but the other ones are the ones I, I guess we need to just keep an eye out for those horses that were, whether the recurrent or whether the drainage just doesn't stop or the lameness doesn't resolve, um, just because there can be so much more going on. So when we're looking at a horse that's non-weight bearing, you know, a lot of times we start with our digital pulses and palpating the coronary bend, looking for any swelling. Um, when we pick up our hoof testers and, and search the foot, you know, it's starting at one heel and working to the other is how I do it. I search, I, if there's a spot that I'm suspicious the abscess is going to be, I usually avoid that and come back to it last. Uh, and then just kind of make sure it's repeat reaction. And the biggest thing I'd encourage you to do is make sure you open up your abscesses in the white line, um, if possible. Uh, every once in a while, we'll come across some abscesses that have been opened up in the sole, and the drainage was great, and the horse did fine for a few days, but then they become lame again. Um, and the worry there is that corium is now prolapsing through the sole, and then we have a whole other issue. Um, and that pro prolapsed corium can be a lameness issue that can last for days to weeks uh, before that corium's dried up uh, well enough to not be painful anymore. So that's something really to think about when you're just opening your basic abscesses. Um, once I have my abscesses open, you know, I, I'm, I'm a person that likes to soak them. Um, I, so I usually tell clients to soak them, whether it's with betadine and salt or whether it's with uh, clean tracks. Um, and then I pack with animal intex. I, I hate all those sticky paste that get everywhere just because I'm not a clean person. So I'm a big fan of using some of those poultice pads. Um, and honestly, for the most part, I never see these horses again. Um, I uh, just let owners deal with it and they usually call me back if there's any issues. Um, I tell them if lameness hasn't resolved or there's still drainage in three days, then to call me back out. And that three days is kind of my good rule of thumb of hey, this might be something more than just a simple abscess. Um, so, you know, if the owner goes on our way, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll have them give some anti-inflammatories. Uh, but if the lameness continues um, past those three days, we'll go ahead and we'll radiograph. And, you know, as a intern, I was sometimes afraid of radiographing. But now looking back, you know, a forty to sixty dollar radiograph to check for an abscess or find that abscess really isn't a big deal in the grand scope of things. When you know, I've had enough horses that have gotten contralimb laminitis or had infected coffin bones, and the bills for those get astronomical. So, not being afraid to reach for my X-ray machine has really helped me in my practice um, and finding some things a little bit faster than I would have previously. Um, so. When I take radiographs for an abscess, I, I take a lateral and three dorsal ventral views. Um, the reason for that is I've had been burned a few times where it was a toe abscess and it was actually secondary from laminitis um, and living in thoroughbred country um, and having so many laminated horses, I do see that quite a bit. Um, and then my three dorsal ventral views, uh, just to give me a great look at the coffin bone. Um, we see a lot of infected coffin bones here in Kentucky. Um, and this is just kind of giving me an overall look of the bone. Also gives me a little hint of what else might be going on inside of there. Uh, say if we had uh, a, a 
uh, sequestrum going on uh, or uh, some other disease process within the hoof capsule itself that could be causing this abscess. So uh, at three days, that's when I do that. Um, we see a lot of pedal osteitis, uh, septic pedal osteitis, and you know it, it's it's a big deal. Um, but I think with some some aggressive treatment, it can be treated very easily. Um, so kind of my my go to for um, septic pedal osteitis is I, I put all those horses on the antibiotic. Um, usually I choose a systemic antibiotic for that. Um, and then I go ahead and shoe them with a treatment plate, um, to get the foot up off the ground. And then I add in larval therapy. Um, and the reason I use larval therapy is because I can use less antibiotics usually, um, and get it treated versus doing regional limb perfusions, uh, repetitively on these horses. And these horses get back to work a lot faster. I find out with that, with the, with the maggots. Um, and usually it's about three days before you really see a noticeable difference in lameness. Um, the maggots last about a week. And then usually by the end of that, we switch to packing with betadine, but the horse has mostly recovered from the lameness. Um, another thing I do quite often is I, I culture a lot of my hoof abscesses. If there are an abscess, I think I can get a good sample of, um, it, taking a culture can be really helpful. Um, especially some of these abscesses that are difficult. Um, so usually if I have changes to the bone, I will take a culture just to make sure. So I'm not behind the game. If, if things don't go as I'd like them to, um, you know, from there, uh, you know, if we do have sequestrum from this, from the sepsis, uh, of course, just pulling that out um, is, is what we have to do um, to treat that just so there's not that constant nidus of infection. Just like if there's any other nidus of infection in there, just removal. Um, you know, we, here I, we see enough of them. We, we do them standing just with local blocks. Um, and then aftercare is, you know, just like every other foot related thing, aftercare is the maker and the break it for these. Um, and if we don't have proper aftercare, you know, it's 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 very frustrating. I know I'm spoiled here because I have managers that know as much, if not more, than me about most things. Um, and I know where when I've been elsewhere, it's not always been the case. Um, so, um, you know, making sure we have the proper aftercare and the owners truly understand what that means. Um, you know, because some of these some of these like um, so, peel sequestrums, my bandaging supplies for aftercare can cost more than the surgery. Um, and sometimes owners don't quite realize that that's such a big expense there. Um, you know, and then there's just a whole bunch of other things that we could have be dealing with, like a keratoma um, that could be causing this chronic abscessing. Um, so just just keeping those things in the back of your mind. Yeah, they're not they're, they're not common, but they are definitely present um, to the point that, you know, with my specialty practice, I probably see a a septic or other beyond simple abscess at least once a week. Um, so they, they are out there. Um, and depending on climate and everything, it can be more, more common than other areas. So what climate uh, but, do you, do you see those more in? Um, we, we see them mostly in the wetter climates is where we see most of these abscesses. Um, so that's why central Kentucky is, is a very wet climate. You know, your, your northeastern areas will be also, and Florida will also be a very wet climate. Um, so those are the areas we really see it in quite a bit. Yeah, I, I had imported a horse from uh, Wyoming to Kentucky, and she came in with just the hardest rock hard feet you've ever seen. And my farrier looked at her and said, wonder how long it'll take those to blow up. <laughs> So. Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible actually. When you move horses from one place to the other, uh, we we were kind of in the middle of a study of seeing what changes. Because as a farrier, if you see a horse that moves down to Florida, then back out west to a dry climate, that foot will actually grow a, a shoe, a half a shoe size, almost a full shoe size, uh, just by going to the wet climates. That that foot's just going to expand. Um, but with that expansion comes more opportunity for for bacteria and diseases to work up into separations that might be within that foot capsule. Well, those are some, some good topics. And I'm going to guess that you're going to get some emails or phone calls with people asking you about a few of those, because I, <laughs> I, uh, I think abscesses are probably the bane of most barriers and veterinarians. Um, so let's, let's move to something else now. Let's talk about hoof cracks. Yeah. So hey, hoof cracks is the big wide open thing. And, what the cracks in the cracks, I mean, a variety of different things. 
You know, our most common cracks that we think of are our toe cracks and our quarter cracks, which are rarer than our surface cracks. And surface cracks can just mean that we're in a dry, hard environment and the foot's not absorbing the concussion like it's supposed to, or we need to shorten our trim cycle. You know, I, I'm not a, I do put topicals on some horses. I'm not a huge fan of topicals just because I don't think that they work as well as um, I like them to at times, but I definitely use some of them. Um, but, you know, if we think about from a veterinarian and farrier standpoint, the ones that really worry me are the toe cracks and the quarter cracks. Um, you know, as, as a veterinarian, if you walk up to a horse with quarter cracks, you know, I, you need to start with just looking at the leg conformation of this horse. Um, cause if this horse has poor leg conformation and because of that, they have poor hoof conformation, that's probably the reason why they have these cracks. Um, so it, usually it's going to be your medial quarter crack. Uh, that, that's going to be the issue. Uh, usually these horses have a very upright wall on the inside, causing uh, more concussion to go directly up the wall and not being absorbed as well as it could otherwise. Um, so how I usually start as a veterinarian is I take radiographs, you know, it, it takes some balance films um, and take quality balance films. If you, if you, if you're questioning your films, you know, definitely send them to somebody that might take more. There's some good papers out there on how to take quality barrier radiographs. And I think it's, it's a weakness. It's, it's, it's something I get sent quite a few radiographs that I really can't make much out of. And, you know, if you're going to be talking to an educated farrier, you know, a journeyman farrier, they're going to know what they're looking for. And, you know, unfortunately as veterinarians, we're going to look like the fool if we can't take proper radiographs for them. Um, so radiographs are a huge thing that I think is really important for these imbalanced horses and a good farrier can take those radiographs, see what we need to change and hopefully prevent that crack from getting worse. Um, so radiographs are kind of the veterinarian's role of that. Um, usually horses with a medial quarter crack are listing slightly medial. They may also have that inside heel sheared upwards. Um, so some people will want to trim the medial side more because of that external upward shearing of the heel, but usually radiographically to level out the bone uh, and level out the capsule, you actually have to trim the lateral side down. Um, so it's something that you have to see, luckily I see in bulk all of these diseases. So um, by doing so, you're, you see how it usually kind of works. Um, and the radiographs have really helped me along the way. Uh, to get there, um, you know, so and, and take balance films for me, you have to have two films. I need a lateral and a dorsal palmar of each foot. Um, and we also need to check our palmar angle. You know, if this is a horse that's also pretty negative um, and maybe it has poor heel quality as well, maybe we need to think about adding something else structurally to help this foot, not just balance it out. Um, you know, as far as quarter crack patches go, I, I do crack patch everything. Um, I know some guys that are against them. Um, and the reason they're against them isn't because they don't think they work. It's because they know that for the most part, if you stabilize the capsule and, and you give it proper support and balance, most of those grow out without any issue. Um, I do just because one, I'm hiding it. Uh, so the owners aren't staring at anything every day because that causes uh, issues with a lot of owners uh, to see this injury. Um, but two, just gives them that little extra stability in case there's a little scar tissue or something down there to give it that kickstart in the right direction. Um, you know, other cracks is our, is our toe cracks. And the vast majority of my toe cracks are related to chronic laminated courses. Um, and that would be just another hint for me that, hey, maybe we do need to take a radiograph uh, of this horse and see if that there's something going on uh, laminitis wise or see if there's a chronic abscess that's causing this crack itself. So reaching for my extra machine is really useful. Um, and then, you know, working with you, working with the farrier um, to figure out what we need to do, you know, because depending on each individual horse and each individual case, it can be very different how we're going to treat these. Um, there's kind of this basic, you know, I share the load to other structures and then stabilize and balance. But, uh, you know, if you have um, a horse that is severely negative, you might need to get a little bit more aggressive with a toe versus a horse that might be a little bit clubby uh, uh, that needs a little bit more protection in the toe and maybe a little bit of a wedge and a better trim job to bring down those heels. So, you know, it's it's. Cracks are fascinating because they tell you so much about the foot and how it's loaded. 
And it's also extremely frustrating because you get a lot of these, you know, Western pleasure horses that are built horrendously and very heavy on the front end with little tiny feet. And you, they start cracking and you get frustrated because you have this foot balance, but they grow out of balance over the course of the cycle. So maybe you need to shorten your cycle um, or something else goes on uh, just because they're such a large animal and such a small foot. Yeah, that, that can be a real issue when you're dealing with some of those uh, performance quarter horses. I, I like, I, I like to uh, <clears throat> see some of the, the good work that's done on some of those horses' feet. Some of them, some of them have really good farriers and vets taking care of them. Oh, they, they completely do. And, you know, I, I, a lot of the best farriers, I don't hear about them much because their horses don't go lame. Because yeah. the good farriers keep these horses going because most lameness comes from the foot. And, you know, there's it's not saying you're a bad farrier because your horses are lame. It's just saying that there's some farriers that are incredible and they can do some pretty incredible things with with not much to work with. Yeah, it's it's I, I love a good farrier. But I also love the point of when the farrier asks the vet for radiographs. I've had that happen to me when I've been in other locations, not necessarily Kentucky. <clears throat> and the farrier gets the radiograph and, and looks at it and goes, can you go get him to do this again? <laughs> so, yeah. That's it's because we, our farriers, our farrier community is becoming more and more educated. We have some very, very educated farriers out there who know what they're looking at and know what they're talking about. And they just need set up for success. Um, to, to fix a lot of these common problems. Today's Disease to Shore podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the makers of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Well, let's talk a little bit about seedy toe. I mean, that's something we see sometimes in these performance horses. So what what do you see there and, and what do you try and do for them? Yeah, so, you know, our, our, our white line disease we see quite a bit um, around here. And, and it's not fully known. The most most logical is it's going to, going to be a mixed anaerobic bacterial infection with probably a little bit of fungal aspects as well. Um, so with it being an anaerobic bacterial infection, we need to open it up to oxygen. So that's why we're doing our, our hoof wall resections. Um, so I like my x-ray machine. So I usually take radiographs to see the extent of the, the damage to begin with and allow me to map out what I want to do. You know, because if you start at a small CD toe area and thinking it's only going to go a few centimeters up the wall and it ends up going all the way to the coronary band, your approach is much different. Um, so I, I start with radiographs and then honestly, I start with either my half rounds to remove it or uh, a Dremel to remove it either, either way. Um, you know, this is one of those things that, you know, if, as a vet, if you see it, you might want to call in a, a quality farrier to help you with the resection uh, that's done some of these uh, because you have to be fairly aggressive and know how to use the tools properly to achieve what we're trying to achieve. You know, and the same thing with the farrier. If you if you're this is outside of your comfort zone, call in a vet just so you have a little bit of backup there uh, for treating this because it, it, it falls into both realms. Uh, it's kind of that gray zone between the two. Um, but what I do is I, I resect until I have a nice tight white line. So all the way through all that kind of dry, crumbly white uh, powder uh, that's in the wall. So I have a nice tight white line all the way at the top, um, you know, and at that point, I go ahead and I like to soak with clean tracks. I know a lot of people like white lightning. Um, I live in central Kentucky. Everything gets soaked in clean tracks here. I do think it is a good product, but that's part of the regional side of medicine. Um, and then I like to keep them as dry as possible. So usually I'll soak them with clean tracks for about three days um, and then pat them off dry and then apply um, some sort of drying agent. Uh, I like to use some of the hoof hardeners just to keep the foot nice and dry um, and that spot from allowing that bacteria to continue. Um, 
if it's more than a small recession, a lot of times I'll go ahead and put a bar shoe on uh, just to stabilize that foot. Since we lost that load bearing wall, we need to load share to other structures. Um, and that's how I load shares. I, I like a lot of short art bars. I think they're very useful. That or you can do leather pads with some oppression material or whatever your barrier skill that is play to their strength because there's a lot of ways to achieve what we're trying to achieve um, and not cause further issue from the white line disease. Um, because I have seen horses founder from white line disease that was too bad. Um, so it, it is something to be concerned with. Um, but with good proper trimming and treatment, usually we can get those resolved pretty quickly. And you just mentioned laminitis, and I know that's that's uh, one of those that can be a long, hard row for veterinarians and farriers. So let's talk about laminitis. Oh, we just opened a can of worms now. <laughs> so, you know, I, I guess when I, I talk to students a lot and the biggest thing I tell students is to take that step back and look at this whole horse. Um, you know, look at look at our coronary band, um, palpate our coronary band. Is there a ledge on the coronary band? And if there is, does it go around medial to laterally a little bit? Um, a lot of times I'll notice changes in my coronary band before I notice major changes on radiographs. So it's a it's a good tool. Um, you know, look at your hoof wall, look for lines in the hoof wall, look for divergence in those lines that are giving you hints that, hey, this might be chronic, it might be acute on chronic. So just lots of hints there and just overall horse's comfort. And then whenever possible, I think we need to take radiographs of these horses. Um, getting our, our lateral and our DP of these horses give us a good strong baseline. So even if there isn't rotation, we have a place to start with. Um, and then from there, it all kind of goes in all sorts of different directions. You know, I our kind of stereotypical laminitic rotational founder, whatever we're going to call it, horse, um, is is something that when the lamina separates, um, we need to relieve the pull of the deep digital flexor tendon to uh, stop the pull on that lamina. So we don't have more separation of that lamina. Um, I go about this usually by elevating the heel. Um, there's a variety of products out there uh, that all are a little bit different, but are very similar. Um, and I've definitely, I've put three different shoes on a horse before I found one that made it comfortable before in a single day, just because a lot of this is trial and error. Um, I originally started carrying just dental impression material and you could just build a wedge onto these horses. It also gave them a little bit of shock absorption and it was a great tool. It's really inexpensive. Your local farrier supply carries it and it works really well. Um, now what I do is for the most part with these acute laminate courses, I have ultimate cuffs with me, uh, from Nanrick. Um, and I, I really like the product, um, when applied properly, it works really well for most rotational horses. Um, and it's something that you can just slip on the foot and bandage on and the horse, I'll have horses that'll walk off more comfortable immediately. Um, so just having different tools in your, your toolbox is really important. And that's a tool that I find is very helpful for me. And it might not be for you, but for me, it works well. Um, you know, the boots, uh, there's lots of different boots out there you can put horses in. And as, as you can tell, I jumped right into mechanics. Mechanics is core for me. You know, all the medicine side of things is great. It's helpful. We're calming the inflammation, blah, blah, blah. We all learned that in school. But the mechanics is something that I think as veterinarians we struggle with at times. And it's something that I think without we don't do justice for the horses and don't get them as many of them back to being athletes as we wanted them to be. Um, so really focusing on the mechanics is important. Um, I will also do venograms at times, especially if horses aren't responding as fast as I want them to, or I have just some, some challenging cases. I do reach for venograms. I find them as a useful tool in my toolbox, but not the be all end all. Um, so, you know, laminase is this enormous category and I do, I can talk about it for hours just because I, I, this is the large part of my practice. Um, but being aggressive with them immediately, making sure we're not just putting them on view um, and calling it a day and just a a addressing the mechanical side of things is really, really important in my book. Um, as far as medicine, though, goes, you know, I, my kind of go to is butyrbanamine. Um, I start at a heavy dose. You know, so a thousand pound horse, I'm starting on two grounds of butte twice a day. Um, you know, I, I cover them with a little bit of gastroguard, but I think breaking that pain threshold is really important. 
Um, so that's where I usually start, you know, pending some other issues, but that's where I usually start um, and try and back them off pretty quickly, but I have no problem using high ends or high levels. Um, and then since I'm in Kentucky, everything's on pentoxifiline. It's another one of those regional drugs, you know, everything that comes down of, out of Ohio is already on isoxaprine before it leaves up the Ohio border. So um, it's something that I think does work. Um, and I, it's, it is rather expensive. Um, so if, if cost is an issue, it's something I will sometimes leave out, but, but I think it is a useful tool. Um, and then icing, I find extremely important as well. I think it's probably short of the mechanics, the most useful thing we have if it's done properly. And it's really hard to do it properly. Uh, there's some really good papers out there about how cool legs can get by different cooling methods. Um, and what we like to use is a slushy, um, so ice and a little bit of water, and that will get them as the coolest that we can. Um, there's actually a little bit of thought process out there that if we don't cool consistently, um, it actually can cause some damage. Um, so if we those horses that we ice four times a day uh, for laminitis, it might not actually be as good as we thought in the past. Um, it's it's still a little bit speculative. There's not great science behind it, but that's kind of the new thought process. Um, and then I usually soak for three days straight at a minimum. Uh, there are some I'll go longer for, but if they're truly acute, I usually put them into whatever mechanics I want and drop all of that into an ice slurry um, and then um, manage that for the next three days before reassessing with another set of radiographs after three days. Well, and it's like you said, you could talk about any one of these for hours on end. And I'm sure you have when you do some of your educational seminars, but let's, let's come up the foot a little bit. I know we, we talked about laminized, talked about the coronary band a little bit. What are some of the common coronary band issues that veterinarians see and what do you do about them? Yeah, so, well, I guess it's coronary and hoof wall avulsions are the, the biggest issue we see and are honestly my favorite disease or process because owners are sitting there crying. They're really upset. There's a big puddle of blood all the way around the horse and you get to walk in there and be the hero because for the most part, unless they've been sitting out in the mud, these horses turn around no problem at all. Um, so, you know, I, I start with those. I, I get these horses cleaned up. I, I soak them heavily until I have all the debris out of them. And then just honestly, we pack them and go on our way. Um, I, I usually throw them on some antibiotics and some other things, but they, they can do really well with very low maintenance. Um, I am a huge fan of casts. Um, so, um, horses that have a hoof wall avulsion, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll get them cleaned up and I grant a on the way to healing and I'll uh, pack them with betadine and put them in a foot cast and tell them to come back in, in two weeks. Uh, sometimes I'll put a little hose in, into there so we can inject a little betadine at that area and keep it uh, covered in betadine. But it's, I, I've had enough horses that have had gotten bad proud flesh or if they weren't packed or wrapped properly or they've worn through their wraps and gotten infected that a lot of times um, using a cast to cover everything up, keep it all nice and packed tightly, um, they do really well in that. Um, I guess taking a step back, I do always ready to grab these horses. I've had a few that have had pretty significant uh, fractures to their coffin bone or navicular bone, um, and that's part of why some of them don't resolve as well. Um, and then that's just a whole other route of things that we can deal with, um, and but also the casting helps with. Um, another thing I can do is that dental impression material. I, I still use a lot of it. Um, and so if you say, hey, my the lateral heel is, is ripped off from our hoof wall avulsion, um, we can uh, put a dental impression material on the bottom of the foot, then cut off the entire lateral heel and float it. So there'll be no pressure up on that area um, and allow us that to heal without any interference from the ground. Uh, so there's lots of little tricks like that when we're dealing with these horses. You know, in uh, most injuries to the hoof wall like that, I, I do like using cast for. So we had talked about earlier, um, 
a anything with barbed wire, so our heel bulb lacerations. I, Kentucky doesn't have them anymore, but when I was out west, we saw a lot of heel bulb lacerations, and I loved cast for those too. You know, it's it's great because you suture everything up nicely, and as long as you're pretty happy with it, it helps to slightly immobilize everything. It keeps everything nice and packed tightly. The owners aren't in there messing with things, um, and it 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 they for me they healed up a lot better. So I would encourage people not to be afraid of putting on casts. I know that can be intimidating, but um, I, it's a very useful tool, and I, I think most people I've talked about using them with when they have gone and used them have been really happy with the success they've had with them. You know, if you're really worried about the infection, you know, I, in some horses that I've had infected ones, I still needed to cast. I, I can cut a little window on my cast and add maggots to there or allow me to treat through the cast itself. So there's a lot of cool little tricks like that you can do for these hoof wall injuries. Um that can help you to help these horses heal without a bad scar. Because once we get our bad scar, now we're just sort of managing what's going forward because we can't fix that. Um, and we see a lot of horses with big quarter crack scars uh, from whether it was a heel bulb laceration or some other injury. Um, and for the most part, um, I, I manage these horses with with a bar shoe of some sort. Um, I like back to liking short heart bars for a lot of these horses. If I can recruit some of the frog or maybe some of the bars, um, and um, from there, the crack itself or the scar itself, as long as it's stable, I don't worry about it too much. I just make sure that it foot's nice and balanced. Uh, but if it's one that likes a quarter crack, we kind of go back to where we were with our quarter cracks. You know, make sure that foot's nice and balanced. I'll occasionally put a little bit of a patch over it. But for the most part, they are big and ugly with, if they scar in, but they do all right. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of that's kind of my spiel on coronary band defects. Well, I don't know about the rest of our audience, but I've learned a lot today. And, and I hope maybe you'll come back and join us some other time and we'll maybe delve into some other topics or maybe a little deeper into some of these and uh, pick your brain. That'd but be great. I love it. Thank you so much for being our guest on today's episode of Disease Du Jour. And we want to thank our audience for listening to the podcast and a special thanks to our sponsor, Merck Animal Health. Please listen and rate previous and future episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher or your favorite podcast platform. Take our survey so we know how to better serve you with this podcast. And if you have any questions or suggestions, you can send me an email at kbrown, that's the letter K, brown, at aimmedia.com.